Uh, this is a little bit of review here, uh, going back to our solutions, but I just wanted to throw this up here because we're going to talk a little bit about solubility and intermolecular forces. And so solvent, that's the stuff really that you have the most of by moles. And then the solute is what gets dissolved into the solvent. And then solubility is just how much stuff can get dissolved. And we know that there's things that affect solubility. If you've ever tried making a salad dressing, you take oil and vinegar and you mix them together and they pfft, kind of separate out. And there's something about the oil and the vinegar that makes them not want to mix. They're not very soluble with each other. And it turns out that there's some kind of intermolecular forces involved in the oil and the vinegar that keeps them from mixing. Okay, so we're going to take a look at that. How does, how does all this stuff work? Okay, so if things can mix, if they can mix in any proportion, any amount, we call this miscible. That's one of these $5 words that say that things can mix in any proportion. So water and alcohol are miscible. It doesn't matter if you have 1% alcohol solution or 99% alcohol solution, they totally mix. That is a miscible solution. Uh, water and gasoline are not immiscible. Uh, water and gasoline don't mix very well. If you have a gasoline fire, don't throw water on it. This is bad. And this is something I learned when I was in Scouts a long, long time ago. If you have a grease fire, don't throw water on it because the grease will just float on top of the water and it just gets really angry when you do that. So that's, that's not good. All right, now, there's something else that uh, happens when we, we mix things together is we can have what we call a dipole-induced dipole interaction. And this is where we can have something that's polar make something that's not polar a little bit polar. Now, that's kind of weird to wrap our heads around. But if you have, say, a water molecule, a water molecule has an oxygen and a hydrogen like this, and we say that these oxygen atoms are electronegative, so they pull the electrons towards themselves and become electronegative. The hydrogens become electropositive like this. This is a polar molecule. Now, oxygen, oxygen on the other hand, here oxygen is... O2 like this, and it's got a couple of lone pairs like that. And we would say that the intermolecular forces for this, we'd have London dispersion forces, but it's not polar. We have two electronegative elements. They're pulling, but they're equal and opposite. So this is a nonpolar molecule. So how is it possible for a nonpolar molecule to interact with a polar molecule? Is oxygen soluble in water? And it is. It is soluble in water. This is how the fishies breathe. Right? They're, breathing, they're breathing oxygen. So how does this work? Well, this water molecule, if it comes in contact or in proximity here with this oxygen molecule, what can happen is this negative here can repel the negative electrons here and push them away, such that we end up with what we call a temporary dipole. So the electrons will be pushed towards the right here, this becomes electronegative. This becomes electropositive, like this, because it's pushing the electrons away. Opposite charges repel. And now this has what we call a temporary dipole, or an induced dipole. An induced dipole. Now, it's a weak intermolecular force. Oxygen is not super soluble in water, but it is a little bit because of this induced dipole, an induced dipole. So that's how we explain how nonpolar things can be somewhat a little bit dissolved in water. Now, ah, oh yes, here we are. Hydrophobic and hydrophilic. This is where we get to practice our Greek. I think this is Greek. So hydro means water, phobic means fear of, and Philic means loving. And there's a city um, in Pennsylvania called Philadelphia. And that means the city of brotherly love. And if you've ever been there for a football game, they don't live up to that. It's not very friendly unless you're an Eagles fan. Even if you are an Eagles fan, that's a rough crowd. But anyway, these words mean water fearing and water loving. And sometimes we have molecules that are both. So for example, if we have this long zigzaggy type molecule, 
I'm going to go like this. And where we have each of these corners uh, would be a carbon atom. This is how organic chemists draw long chains of carbon atoms. They just do zigzaggy lines with the idea that there would be a carbon at each one of these. Organic chemistry shorthand. And at the end here, I'm going to put an OH like this. And we recognize that OH, oxygen, is very electronegative. So this right here could do hydrogen bonding. But this long chain down here, this is nonpolar. And so I'm just going to label this here, down here. This is nonpolar on this end. And this end down here is polar. And because of that, this end here does not like water. Water is polar. And so we would say that this end here is hydrophobic. And this end over here is hydrophilic. I have to remember how to spell it. P-H-I, P-H-I-L-L-I-C, hydrophilic. One L, hydrophilic. Okay, hydrophilic. And so one end would would be attracted to water. This other end here, not so much. So then, kind of makes you wonder, what would happen if you put this in contact with water? Well, this end would stick to the water, and this end here would not. So it's like it, if you had a, I'm just imagining like a cup of water here, like this. Here's our water. You'd have one end that would be attracted to the water, and the other end would be sticking up, not so much attracted to the water. Now, this gets really helpful for making soap. Now, there's a great story on this. And like all great stories, we don't know if this is true or not. But what we know is true is outside of the city, I believe it's in Italy, there's a mountain outside of the city of Rome. I believe it is called Mount Sopa. Kid you not. And long, long time ago, people used to do animal sacrifices to the gods. They might still do that, I don't know. But they used to do animal sacrifices. And the best animals to sacrifice would be animals that had lots of fat on them. And there's some passage in some old book about sacrificing the fatted calf. Okay, the, so you take a big fat animal and you sacrifice it. So you cut it up and you light it on fire and you pray to the gods for good harvest or whatever. Okay, so what ended up happening is, is some sort of chemical reaction when they burned these animals and it would rain and, and ashes and such from the fire and the burned animals would flow down Mount Sopa to the river. And the people that were doing their laundry in the river there noticed that the clothes got really clean after they did sacrifices on this mountain. And this, this river next to Mount Sopa was the best place to do laundry. This is all true. And this is the part we don't know is, is true. That this is the source of soap, where soap came from. We think, maybe, but we're not 100% sure. It makes for a great story. So how does this work? Well, if you take a fat, now, olive oil is a type of fat. This is what we call an unsaturated fat. That is to say it's a liquid at room temperature. Um, and, and it has something to do with the chemistry as well. And you react it with a base, in this case, sodium hydroxide. You end up producing soap. Now, how does this magic work? Well, if you have, say, animal fat, and you mix it then with the ashes of a wood fire, which is very basic, it has what we call lye in it, it ends up chemically changing and becoming soap. And the chemistry on this is kind of fancy. You don't need to write this down. Um, but basically, the idea is you have fat. And fat is, is chemically a big chain here of molecules. And so I'm just going to go like this. This is just chemistry shorthand. You will not be asked to do this on a test. But we have a chain of molecules like this, excuse me, a chain of carbon atoms like this. And then what we have on there is a double bond oxygen, a single bond oxygen like this. And that then connects, if I'm doing this correctly, to a carbon chain like this. And then it repeats, okay? So we have an oxygen and double bond oxygen and some 
like this. I'm not an artist. Certainly not teaching organic chemistry, okay, but looks something like this, okay. And then what we do is you add a strong base to it, such as sodium hydroxide, like that, okay. And when you do that, it's going to break this molecule apart. And we have some names for this here. Um, we have this, these chains here. These are called fatty acids. And this right here, <laughs> this backbone here, has a special name. It's called glycerin. I'm not sure if I'm spelling this right. C E R C E R I N. Glycerin. Okay. And so when these interact with each other, they break apart, as, as you can see here in the slide, into these, these fatty acid um, soap molecules here on the left and then glycerin on the right. Now these soap molecules, the way that these soap molecules work is you have one end that is polar, that is hydrophilic. It loves water. Okay, so that end there likes water. This end down here does not like water so much. And so when it comes in contact with dirt or grease, if you have dirt or grease, and you want to wash that off of your hands, water doesn't really work very well all by itself. If you have greasy hands, you need to use soap. And so what the soap molecules do is those nonpolar ends would be attracted to the grease and the polar ends would be attracted to the water. And that creates these, these, these complexes, we call these things micelles, that help the dirt and the grease to become soluble in water. And this is how soap works. And I'm a big fan of soap. I think it ranks up there with like one of the top three inventions of, of like ever is soap. Soap is pretty darn awesome. Now, anybody recognize this word? Yeah. Where have you heard this word? In a song. Really? How's, I, I'm curious. Oh. I can't sing either. I mean, I can, but people pay me not to. Yeah. No, don't agree with me. That hurts my feelings. No, no it's okay. It's okay. okay. No, that's okay. Um, where, where have you heard this? Opening safes. Oh, oh yeah, you could. Yeah, yeah, there could be a, yes, yeah. Where else, have we, where have we heard glycerin? Nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin. Yeah, so if you take glycerin and you react it with nitric acid, you produce nitroglycerin, which is a very unstable explosive. Very, very unstable explosive. So back, I think it was World War I or World War II, there was this group called uh, 4-H Fu um, and Future Farmers of America, and they had contests for uh, kids that lived on farms to grow hogs that had the most fat. It, as much fat as possible. And it seems like an odd thing to do. Why would you incentivize kids to grow pigs with like lots of fat? And the reason was, is during the war, they would take the pig fat, react it with a base, produce glycerin, then react it with nitric acid and produce nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin then could be used in the war. Like, huh, how about that? Isn't that curious? Now, nitroglycerin is very, very unstable. And when people would do this, they would take uh, the nitric acid and the glycerin, and you'd stir it in a bucket. And you had to be very careful when you do this. Um, it was exothermic, and if it got too hot, it might detonate. And if you bumped it, it might detonate. And if you looked at it funny, it might detonate. And so true story, the people that would do this, they would have stools that would have one leg on it. So as you're sitting there and you're stirring it, if you start to fall asleep, you'd fall over, and that would, that would be the way to keep you awake. Now, there was a, a guy who had a nitroglycerin factory. His name was DuPont, and he had a brother who was stirring the bucket, and um, his brother fell asleep or something. We're not sure what happened, and it blew up. And so you might have heard of the DuPont Chemical Company. They got their start doing nitroglycerin, 
and selling it to the North during the American Civil War. They also sold it to the South, because wars are very profitable when you sell you know, explosives to both sides. Um, so another famous person, Alfred Nobel, was trying to figure out a way to um, produce explosives without having people like die in the process of making them. And he took something a little bit different. I'm going to show you another molecule here. Um, he took toluene. And toluene has a structure that looks like this. Now it's six carbon atoms. Six carbon atoms forming a ring structure. And there's double bonds in here, like this, like this, like this. And so sometimes when organic chemists draw these, they get lazy and they will just draw it like this. Okay, so we call that like a benzene ring or an aromatic ring. And toluene has a methyl group here. That's toluene. And I'm going to try here. I'm trying to remember this. Tol U E N E. I'm hoping I'm spelling that right. Is that good? Thank you. You saved my butt so many times this semester. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Okay, so that's toluene. Now, if you take toluene and you react that with nitric acid, HNO3, you get something else. That something else looks like this, where we have our toluene, but then we've nitrated it like this. Oh, wait a minute, I, I got a little crazy there. Okay, there. Okay, and I think, I'm trying to remember if it looks like this, N H, no, N O 2, I think. N O 2, okay. I think, I think that's how that is. And um, this here has a fancy name. Tri nitro, tri nitro toluene. We've added three nit nitrate groups to it. Well, sort of. NO2? I think it's N2. Hey, Michael, could you Google that for me? Thank you. I don't remember if it's N3 or N2. I think it's N2, but I'm not positive. But anyway, um, I'm not trying to teach you how to become, I don't know, what's the, what the word for it? Dangerous, I guess. Anybody recognize what this is? Oh, yeah, are we good? Oh, whew, man, it's been a long time since I made this stuff. Well, I got a full-time job. I don't have to anymore. Yeah. Okay. Um, anybody recognize what this is? That's dynamite, TNT. Yeah, so this was Alfred Nobel figured out a way to make an explosive that wouldn't just spontaneously go off and, and kill workers and such. Yeah, this is TNT. And the reason this is so explosive is when you react this, um, when it explodes, it produces nitrogen gas. Nitrogen gas, if we remember back to our thermodynamics, that the energy, the enthalpy of reaction is bonds breaking minus bonds forming. Bonds forming. Forming lots of nitrogen gas molecules releases a stupendous amount of energy very quickly. And so when we think of explosives, they often are nitrogen compounds because they release nitrogen gas. And that's where we get the big bang from. Let me rephrase that. We get big booms from. The big bang happened because of something different. Okay, that's physics, you gotta take a different class. Okay. All right, so that's how soap works. Um, yeah, and that's it. We'll leave it at that.